Okay, hello everyone. So we're going to allow a few seconds to allow everybody to come in and join us today. Okay, great. Good to see everyone today. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Brian McDonald, and I'm the Director of Plant Relations with Anja Education Consultants. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today, where for the next 20 minutes, we will be sharing some of our key insights and best tactics for college admissions. Then we'll quickly give you a couple of options if you'd like to meet with us and talk to us directly. And then the balance of the time is gonna be dedicated to your questions. Okay. Great. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the president of Anja Education Consultants, Anjali Mazel. Anjali is a former Princeton University interviewer, a TED Talk speaker, a college admissions expert, and she is also a proud mom of a thriving 24-year-old who's now in grad school. Anjali has helped hundreds of students get into their top perfect match schools, including Yale and Stanford, John Hopkins, and Vanderbilt, sophomore in UT Austin, just to name a few. So, okay, uh, thanks again for being here today, and it's over to you, Anjali. Thanks so much, Brian. Hi, everybody. I am so glad to be here with you today. And I know that many of you are here because you can clearly see that applying to college has become much more challenging. Many of you are probably feeling a mixture of excitement and anxiety. So let me first begin by just saying that I really understand these feelings, both as a parent and a professional in this field. And by the end of this talk today, after I outlined the specific challenges and solutions, I think you're going to feel not only more clear and in control of this process, but also more confident and aligned with what you truly want. So I'd like to begin by telling you a brief story. I grew up in New York City, and I went to an extremely competitive high school. Just to give you an idea, I usually had five to six hours of homework every night and really felt oppressed by it all. I did well despite that and could not wait, though, to get out of there and go to college. My senior year in high school was truly bizarre. My classmates and their parents got together and offered me cash to withdraw my applications after I was admitted early action to Yale. Apart from the unsettling feeling this gave me, I had not really decided if I wanted to attend that school. I wanted to see what other options opened up for me in the spring. And as it turned out, I ended up not going to Yale, but Princeton instead. But this experience left me feeling very ill at ease. So when planning my own son's education, I was determined that he would not suffer the kind of crushing, toxic academic atmosphere that I had endured, which I did not feel served me in the long run. I wanted my son to be happy, first and foremost, and also successful, but how to strike the right balance. So the difficulty started with, with choosing a high school for him. We went back and forth between competitive, well-known prep schools and a small unknown school that prioritized love of learning and independent projects. I realized that either way there would be trade-offs, but in the end, I chose a small school where my son found his passion. And given that I had been an interviewer for many years for Princeton, as well as a teacher who wrote letters of recommendation and gave college essay guidance, you'd think it would have been easy for me to guide my son through his college applications, right? Not true. So I ended up hiring a colleague to work with him. And after many months, at the end of a surprisingly difficult process, he not only got into an Ivy League school, but that is not what he chose. He made what some of you might think was a very unexpected choice. And I will tell you all about it at the end of the webinar. So what I want you to know is that I have been where you are. Although I knew the system well, when my son applied to college, I had complicated feelings. Like many parents, I was vulnerable to confusion, frustration, and fear. But I did learn something important. 
I discovered that my son, like all of you here today, was facing a threefold problem when applying to college. Number one, increased competition. Number two, the complexity of the application process. And number three, the rising cost of college. Now, what does this challenge look like in practice? So first, let's look at the competitiveness of college admissions. If you were a Texas student in the 90s and graduated in the top 20% of your graduating class, you were automatically admitted to University of Texas at Austin. Today, you'll need to graduate in the top 6% of your class. If you were applying to Yale in the 90s, you had an 18% chance of admission. Now it's under 5%. And 70% of USC applicants were admitted in the 90s, but in 2022, it's now under 12%. Maybe some of you read a recent Wall Street Journal article about a young woman who with an SAT score of 1550, a GPA of 3.95, phenomenal extracurriculars and leadership positions who applied to top tier schools and was admitted to none of them. So there's no doubt that college admissions today is super competitive. Now let's look at the complexity of the application process. So 20 years ago, you might've applied to one or two colleges. The process was clear, simple, and straightforward. And now because of the many parts of the applications, Students are applying to more colleges, as many as eight to 15 for my students. So there's a lot to stay on top of. And recently, a friend of mine was telling me about the ordeal of helping his son apply to college last fall. The numbers of different essays for each college, the completely different online platforms to fill in, SAT prep, coordinating with the school, different deadlines, additional essays for scholarships, recommendations for honors programs, coordinating summer internships, updating transcripts multiple times. All of this was a ton of work and created months of tension with his son. So clearly this complexity needs to be simplified. Now, after the complexity and the competitiveness of college admissions, the fact is that college has gotten incredibly expensive. If you'll please look at this graph and brace yourself, this really illustrates how the cost of college tuition has exploded. The red line here on the bottom is the rate of inflation. And as you can see, the black line on top is the rate of increase in college tuition. Now, clearly college tuition has massively outpaced inflation for decades now. Private colleges can cost up to $77,000 per year, while in-state tuition from public schools can cost up to $28,000 per year. But here is the good news. Merit scholarships can be worth tens of thousands of dollars and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do we do this? Here are three quick success stories which illustrate how students can gain a competitive edge, simplify the complexity, and maximize scholarships to reduce the cost of college. Let's start with Tony. He, uh, we got to know him early in 10th grade, and Tony had high A's and an SAT score in the 1500s. He was stellar in math, so his teachers naturally pushed him toward engineering. But after talking with Tony, he made it very clear that engineer, engineering was not what he wanted. However, and this was the game changer, he turned out had a significant talent in, and passion in art as well as STEM. So we were able to match him with a local art mentor and a summer program to develop a portfolio, the portfolio that we could then include with his applications. Exploring his interest in visual arts and combining this with his talent in math led Tony to discover a passion for architecture. And this discovery made all the difference because it made Tony really stand out. Why? Because now Tony had a story to tell and nothing will make you stand out from the crowd than having your own story that demonstrates genuine passion and growth. So to summarize, um, Tony discovered his passion. Uh, he was able to simplify the application process to, got, to get to a clear major and career path he loved, architecture. And Tony secured a $100,000 scholarship to Tulane. Finally, by curating his art portfolio and targeting his essays to align with architecture and his new vision for himself, 
Tony found a competitive edge. So the result is that Tony was admitted to Rice, his first choice, where he has now finished a successful freshman year. In this way, Tony solved the threefold problem of college admissions. But not all of us are not all of us are straight A students like Tony. Many of us get A's and B's. We might have a down year, get sick, or be in a competitive high school, but we are still ambitious. This was Ellen. Ellen had a B average from a competitive high school, but was confident about thriving in a selective college. We discovered that her GPA had significantly improved over the three years of high school through her hard work. When she got B's, it motivated her to get tutoring and find a college professor to mentor her, and she kept signing up for challenging classes. She also rose to a leadership position in yearbook and got a summer internship in a startup incubator to explore a major in business. But how was she going to pull all these threads together to showcase her accomplishments? Ellen worked to tell her story in a compelling way as a journey of growth and responsibility. She demonstrated through her essays and applications how she learned from setbacks, how these setbacks led her to develop and improve. In fact, they became her assets. So maybe you or your child are like Ellen. You discovered a specific passion halfway through high school. Maybe you began to excel by the end of junior year. Or maybe you're a straight A student who has a clear major from, from the start. In any case, you may not recognize what is exceptional about you. And everybody has a powerful story to tell. You need to tell your story in a memorable way your passions, your challenges, your successes. So to summarize, for Ellen, she simplified the application process by keeping accountable and breaking down the long list of tasks into small steps. She submitted standout applications and eventually received 12 scholarship offers ranging from $20,000 to $100,000. She gained a competitive edge by pulling all her academic and extracurricular experiences together into a compelling story in the essays and, and in the interviews. So despite her GPA, she was admitted as a business major to Emory University, her first choice. So Ellen solved the threefold problem of college admissions. Now, Grace's story is slightly different. She had an A, B average, no test scores that she was willing or uh, that would be a good idea to share. And she had a remarkable singing talent that she needed to showcase. So what was the solution to the threefold problem of admissions for Grace? First, to simplify the process, she, she needed to stay organized and on tasks by using spreadsheet and an application tracking system. Second, she kept costs down by optimizing all aspects of the applications and tailoring the college list in Grace's case. She was awarded scholarships ranging from eighty to $199,000. And third, as Grace was a singer, she gained a competitive edge by curating her vocal submissions and getting admitted into the super selective Grammy summer camp. In the end, she was accepted to her first choice school, California Institute of the Arts, also known as CalArts. So the three students we discussed, Tony, Ellen, and Grace, were all success stories, but very different one from another. Yet for all these students, they solved the problems of competitiveness, complexity, and cost of college. Through these case studies, we hope you have gotten some valuable tips on what to prioritize in college planning. Now, before we answer your questions, which is going to be the bulk of this webinar, let's first answer the most common one, which is simply how you can work with us. So before we give you the three simple options of working with us, here is our track record. So um, our track record for scholarships for the 2022 application cycle, our students received over $2 million in scholarships and the average total amount of scholarships per student in 2022 was 182,000. So the return on investment of our families was very high and our fees were covered many times over. Now in this same application cycle, our students, students we worked with, 
were admitted to some of the most selective colleges in the country, including Stanford, Dartmouth, University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, as well as excellent schools such as UC Riverside, Penn State, Ohio State, Texas A&M. Best of all, they, these were also the right fit for each student. So if you want uh, to, to gain a competitive edge, simply and simplify the application process and keep costs down, like the hundreds of students we've helped ace college admissions, here are the three simple options. Option one is for eighth to 10th grade students. It's a one year talent development package. And here we have time to identify your kids' talents, discover their passions, make sure they're really on track. And this option maximizes admission and scholarship results when they apply to college later on. We will help optimize their GPA, test scores, extracurriculars, and summer planning. And packages start at 1997. Option number two is our two-year packages for 11th and 12th graders. First, the A-list application package, our most popular one, will give you a competitive edge, simplify the complex application process, keep costs low. We will help optimize essays, SAT prep, and testing and applications, summer planning, as well as demonstrated interest score for each college. And these packages are around 12,000 with the ability to provide some level of customization depending on your situation. And in this A-list one, you're working directly with me. Option three is again a two-year package for 11th and 12th graders. It is the same as the A-list, but instead of working with me, you're working with an advisor I have handpicked and trained. And that one is $69.97. So if you're serious about working with us, please sign up for our free discovery session. Bring your questions. Students, please have both parents with you. So sign up for times when they are available. And parents, please bring your spouse. So Sydney, our wonderful moderator, is going to drop the sign up link in the chat now. Um, again, this session is designed to explore our packages and answer your questions. Students, please bring your parent, so sign up for when they can attend. Parents, please bring your spouse. So now, before I uh, answer your questions, I want to finish my story that I started with about my son who applied to college a few years ago. So at the end of the process, as I mentioned, he did in fact get into an Ivy League school, but that is not what he chose. Instead, after a lot of research, investigation, deep reflection, and a visit to campus, my son chose an amazing school, Carleton College in Minnesota, which you may or may not have heard of, but turns out employers, grad schools, prestigious fellowship boards know really well. It was a far, by far, a better choice for him than the Ivy he was admitted to. And at Carleton, my son got more attention, classes were more targeted, his professors advocated for him. He stood out and after his freshman year, he was awarded the Orion Mission Internship at NASA and a second Orion Mission Internship at NASA the following summer. Today, he's in grad school at an Ivy League college and tells me that in retrospect, Although some disagreed with his college choice, this was absolutely the right decision for him. And best of all for me as a mom, he's happy and thriving. So parents and students, you may be anxious right now, but I can assure you that there are many roads to success. Please remember that college is not a destination. The college application process can help you begin to discover your purpose, a great first step in designing a life of meaning and financial growth. This is what I really wish for all of you. So I am looking forward to reading your questions, answering your questions. Um, before we go into that again, uh, Sydney, please put that link in the chat again. Uh, students, please bring your parents. So sign up for a session when they can attend and parents, please bring your spouse. 
So I am um, going to be looking at questions uh, right now and um, just want to uh, see where they are. Yes, Q&A, very good. Okay. So um, what is a BGPA in numbers? Okay, so on a 4.0 scale, the easiest way to look at this is if you have, uh, if you look at uh, unweighted GPA, that means there are no GPA boosts for um, AP classes or honors classes. It's just the straight grade. Um, that would be, uh, a, a B on a 4.0 unweighted scale would be a 3.0, and that would be a B unweighted. So um, these scales, uh, you know, it's helpful if possible to get an unweighted GPA because in, in that way, um, colleges can compare one college to the other in, a, in, a, in a, clearer, a clearer way. But if you only have a weighted GPA, that's perfectly okay. Um, do you have to submit your SAT to be eligible to apply for merit scholarships? Uh, that's a good question. Some schools still require test scores, but many schools will do a holistic uh, reading of an application, even for scholarships without SAT scores. It depends on the school, and this is really important. So if you're applying test optional, be very, very sure um, that the, and, and if merit uh, scholarships are important to you, be very, very sure that the college is actually offering uh, merit scholarships for um, non, uh, for test optional applicants. Um, question, this is an interesting question. My son doesn't know what he wants to do. How can you help him? So there are uh, many ways, you know, that, that students and parents can begin to, to look at PATH, right? When we work with students, uh, we have an interest and strengths assessment. There are many interest and strengths assessment or personality assessments out there. Uh, you can, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, a wide variety. Some are even free. Um, the one that I use is very robust because not only does it provide insight into which environments, which work environments, which learning environments a student will thrive in, but they give very specific recommendations about careers um, that would be a good fit. Um, but don't make the mistake of thinking that these tests are mathematical equations and that they always get it right. They are a point of departure for self-reflection and conversation. Another way is to be sure that students have opportunities. A job in the community is a great way to learn about yourself, to, to develop your strengths, to get a great letter of recommendation. It can be volunteering. It can be in any area. It can be, um, you know, it, it, for an artist, it will be uh, using their art. There are many different ways that a students we, even within their local communities, but also online, also out of state, can begin to um, have those experiences that are going to tell them, I really like this, but I don't like that. I'm really much better in these kinds of situations than I am in those kinds of situations. Unless a student is actively involved in the real world, getting that feedback, it's very difficult to just kind of sit in a room and imagine and then pick a major and a career. So I, I recommend that. Um, and then I think your question is, uh, how can you help him? Well, you know, we have, a, that's the talent development uh, approach that we take for all students is, is, is we give them very specific, um, not only assessments, but then um, we pair them with mentors, we find the right research programs for them, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but these resources are available and you can do that on your own as well with some research. Um, okay, I am a straight A student, I like all my classes, uh, but I don't know which ones I'm really passionate about. Okay, that's a really good question, right? Um, Again, I would have to know, this is from Noah. I would like to know, Noah, 
which grade are you in, right? Because what you're going to do to find a passion in ninth grade versus 12th grade may be very different. You can do some of the same things. Um, you can even plan to spend next summer if you're in 12th grade, you can, after you graduate from high school, you know, shadowing different um, uh, people in, in different professions to see, you know, you don't have to know what you want to do when you get to college. You can even apply undecided. However, when you tell your story, just like I illustrated in those case studies, even if you're undecided, try to know the areas that you're most attracted to now. It doesn't mean that this is the thing that you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. It means that you have started on a process of exploration. You're taking steps to find out. And college is one of those steps, right? You may you know, some students are later bloomers than others and, and will not even discover the kind of their main passion until college. And that's perfectly okay, right? Don't uh, think you have to fit into a box. That's what I said at the end, many roads to success. Um, but, you know, if there's something that interests you, one of your courses, and you want to take it further, that's one way of exploring, right? There are many free online courses that you can take in a specific subject or summer um, activities. Try to align your extracurricular activities with your academic interests or combine them in a way that is meaningful to you and that helps you tell that compelling story at the end. Okay, um, how did your son know which college he wanted to go to with a scholarship? Right, so the college list is really important right? It's really important because some colleges are much more likely to um, get you, uh, give you merit scholarships. There is a book by journalist Jeff Selingo, S-E-L-I-N-G-O. If you want to learn all about merit scholarships, read the, that book. Now, what he talks about is how you look at data about colleges to learn which ones are the most likely to give you scholarships, that's super important, but it's not the whole story. That's half the story. The other half is how are you going to make yourself most attractive to the colleges to increase uh, chances of admission? Um, so there, those two sides of it, right? And, and, and if you can learn about those two sides, this talk today was about the educational strategies. It's about how you can tell that story in a way that really reaches admissions, where they can hear it, where they're excited to hear your story, where they can clearly see how you're gonna contribute to their college community. That's one side of it. The other side is what Jeff is talking about in his book, and um, highly recommend that as well as a, as a resource. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, yes, yeah, so the packages that we mentioned, um, yeah. So so our prices, our prices is are, are you know, parents and families invest in working with us, and then on the other end, you have those savings. Um, $182,000 total, uh, that was the average for 2022. Average individual scholarship per student was 80,000. So, you know, if you're saving 80,000 and you're paying uh, us 13,000, you can see that that is a worthwhile return on investment. That's how to think about it. Um, lots of sites uh, applying for scholarships. So, you know, there's some good sites like um, fastweb.com. There's um, Scholly, uh, you know, a, a few of those top sites. However, keep in mind that the largest scholarships are going to come directly from the universities. That's why uh, telling your story in a compelling way that I've been talking about through this whole webinar is so incredibly important. Because when you can uh, present yourself in that way, then uh, you're going to be able to um, enhance your chances of admission and increase your, the amount of scholarship that you're going to be offered. 
it's not a formula. Some schools have more kind of formulaic approach where it's like certain SAT score, certain GPA cut off above that, you get the scholarship below that you don't get, you know, but fewer and fewer colleges are doing that. Mostly it's, um, you know, um, uh, review. Um, Sydney, I think we've got a panelist who uh, needs to be muted. So I'm going to ask you to do that. Uh, thank you. And then um, Tommy, so let's see, how can I increase my chances of getting accepted to any college or university? Uh, yeah, so basically um, what we've been talking about tonight, which is how to pull together the threads of your story in a compelling way to get the attention of uh, admissions. Um, that's, it's all about story. It's all about story. So the question is, what is your story, right? The question is, um, how does your, how do your academics and extracurriculars fit together? Uh, don't think that story has to be something dramatic, right? Let me give you an example. I had a student apply to NYU, uh, New York University last year. Um, he had good grades, but really he didn't have time to do anything kind of leadership positions or anything like that because he spent all his free time taking care of his little sister, cooking for the family and cleaning the house because his mother was a single mom and she uh, she didn't have time. He would take her his little sister to school, pick her up, take care of her. I mean, he had a huge family responsibility. It was a it was like a part time job apart from school. So, you know, when he first uh, came to us, he was he wanted to go to law school and he wrote his main personal statement on, you know, why he wanted to go to law school and all the injustices that he saw in the world, etc. Now, that is important for the colleges to know, but that was not the time in the personal essay to talk about that. What was the time? What was the what was supposed to go into that essay and ended up going into that essay because we helped him with that is uh, telling his story about you know what he does with his time. It was impressive for a young man his age to have that amount of responsibility. So don't think that this you know that you have to come up with this kind of um, really dramatic kind of story. It's your story, but it's how you tell it. It's how you're going to uh, put, put your best foot forward, right? Um, okay. And let's see, if you receive scholarships within the U.S., um, can they be used for international universities? Okay, interesting. Um, I think what you would have to do then is apply to third party scholarships through fast web through uh, but but be sure before you spend your time doing that that you've checked that they are going to allow you you know to to put that toward an international university um so what do you think the best uh, art schools are there are some amazing art schools out there some of the ones that uh, i know well um that students of ours have, have gone to rhode island school of design Maryland Institute of Art, Parsons, um, and uh, SCAD. Uh, so, you know, th there, there are a lot of good schools. Um, I would look at uh, their um, pl job placement. How, where are their grads working in? That's how I, one of the ways I'd, I'd check about them. Not the only way, but one. Um, Okay, does it having an amazing essay help with scholarships or is it only because of your academics? Everything helps, you see. Uh, the most helpful thing is rigor of academics, both for admissions and scholarships, rigor of academics, academic performance, um, sometimes test scores, but a lot of merit scholarships are not given because of that. They're given because of an outside talent. And the talent doesn't have to be artistic. If you have spent, you know, a tremendous amount of time supporting your community or serving in your church or whatever it is that you've done, you know, there are scholarships 
uh, for that, even within the colleges. Um, so it depends on your college list. Again, the college list is one of the best ways to be sure that you're going to get what you need and that you are targeting schools that are going to be able to give you what you need. Um, okay, what do you recommend for generalists uh, who don't have a clear passion but are thriving and very well overall without a clear edge? Yeah. So. Um, there is something, a type of student who I call a renaissance, renaissance kid. They have many talents, they have many interests. They're not necessarily, you know, don't, don't have that standout kind of um, uh, talent that, that sets them apart. Um, there are ways to, um, to convey that story in a meaningful way focusing on critical thinking skills, on making connections, uh, sharing, you know, a, a, an academic paper that reveals those things like uh, critical thinking skills and um, thinking outside the box, creativity. There are many ways, again, to um, kind of uh, prioritize the elements of this, uh, the strengths of, 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 of this student. So um, that's how I would look at it is, you know, yes, generalists don't have a specific talent, but the combination of talents may be unique or the lens through which they see the world may be unusual because of the way they're able to make connections. Um, okay, how important are AP courses to colleges? So. Uh, some colleges have an AP system, some colleges have an IB system, some colleges don't have either IB or AP, they'll have something called honors or they'll have advanced. Um, it's all about, and you'll see this on every admission website, what have you done with the opportunities that were offered to you in your school, in your community, right? They're not gonna be comparing a student who has access to three APs in their school, and there are. There are even schools that say no APs before the end of junior year. They're not gonna look at that student the same way as they're gonna look at a student who, you know, was, had, you know, 25 APs available from ninth grade to all the way to the 12th. They're going to look at you in the context of what is available to you in your school and in terms of extracurriculars in your community. Now, um, what you don't want to do is overload APs and burn out. Watch a movie called Race to Nowhere. It's not a good plan. However, this is the, this is the trick. You want that balance between uh, challenging yourself, taking the most rigorous courses you can, doing well in them, and taking care of yourself, prioritizing your well-being. Uh, without well-being, students have nothing. Uh, well-being has to be, and this is something that even the Surgeon General has now come out and said, they, they've called on um, an organization that we're interviewing on our first podcast uh, called Challenge Success. And the, the Surgeon General called on this uh, nonprofit because of how many students are, are, you know, burning out and stressed. And this, we do not want this, right? As I said in my webinar, there are many, many roads to success. Now, if you're a very kind of, um, you know, you're very efficient in the use of your time, you're able to accumulate APs, fantastic, do it. You know, if you enjoy it, if you're good at it, um, but um, they, they wanna see if you've challenged yourself and done well in the context of what is offered at your school. Uh, okay, uh, okay, what if you don't have the money and are poor but a straight A student and who did so much but can't do many extracurriculars. That was exactly the story of the young man I told you about. He couldn't do no extracurriculars, none. 
Uh, he got into NYU. Um, he wrote his essay about all the things he did to help around the house. And um, he showed his motivation. So there are many ways to demonstrate your character because you know what, fundamentally, what do these colleges want? They want people who are really motivated. They also want people, students who um, have a, a good heart, you know, who have, a, who are there helping their community or their family. Um, they also want um, students who, um, do, regardless of their circumstances, have done have done the best that they could. So don't worry about that, but do tell your story, right? Be very clear about that. So they understand. If you don't tell them, they're not gonna know. Um, okay, do you think homeschool students are special or disadvantaged, especially high performance in AP courses and exams with high performance? Okay, I'm not sure if you're saying that the, op that the homeschool student has performed really well in AP courses and exams, or if you're like, you're comparing the homeschool student with students who've done a lot of AP. Um, for the homeschool student, the burden is on the homeschool student to demonstrate through the transcript, the homeschool um, uh, school profile, and the description of the courses that the rigor has been really strong. And it's doable, you know? There are uh, all sorts of resources uh, for homeschool families to be able to put that together. Uh, and there are uh, schools that offer AP courses to homeschool students. A lot of online courses like um, Johns Hopkins, uh, for example, has a, offers a lot of AP classes online. So yeah, not totally sure what your question is, but I hope that that was helpful, okay. Uh, let's see, uh, my interests are changing my career, but I'm in my senior years at too late to go with a change. Never worry about too late. You have got to do what, uh, you know, you feel called to do. Um, now that doesn't mean that you may necessarily state that on the application. You may be strategic and show, you know, um, if it's, it's if it's possible to transfer major easily, you might end up um, applying for a certain major because all your you know academics and your extracurricular support that. And then if it's possible in that school to transfer, that could be a good strategy. But some schools don't allow easy transfers, so in that case, it's just better to just say the thing the way it is, and you know to target schools that make sure you have a balanced college list, likely three likelies, three targets, and the rest can be reaches, far reaches, and likelies and targets. Now, how do we say which are likely and targets? The easiest way is go by admit rate because uh, the college application process is very, very uh, opaque. It is not transparent. They're not, the colleges have their own agenda. It's really important not to take this whole thing personally. There are a lot of, you know, it's really more about what they're looking for that year. Do they need a clarinetist that year? Do they need more people from Idaho because the previous year too many people, they admitted too many people from Iowa. That's, in the end, you know, if you compare equally qualified candidates to a school, that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna tip the scale. So when you know that, you know, hey, it's really, especially for the super selective schools, it's really more like a lottery. What you want is to get a ticket to the lottery. How do you get a ticket to the lottery? You do really, really outstanding applications, outstanding essays that really tell your story in a compelling way. You get the ticket to the lottery, but you have an open attitude of this country has 4,000 schools and you know four-year colleges or more there are so many great ones out there, you know, and then this process can actually be wonderful, wonderful and exciting. Okay, um, my child has no extracurriculars but a part-time job. Um, again, it depends on the family circumstances. When families are financially struggling and a student is contributing to the household budget by having a part-time job or, you know, um, there, there are reasons in that student's story 
then please don't, you know, that's that on the contrary, that that demonstrates a lot of um, responsibility. And even if that's not the case, even if a student chose to do a job for a certain reason, that it can still work. It can still work really well. It just depends, again, how that story is told. Um, what is the best advice to know which college you're attending and how to get a full scholarship? Certain colleges offer full rides. Some, uh, uh, some, some colleges offer full rides and some do not. So the first thing is if, you, if you're looking for a full ride is look for the colleges that do offer full rides and look at what their selection criteria are and see if you think you would qualify. That's the first step. Um, okay, let's see. How would we find internships in our area that would help our applications? Yeah, so um, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, you know, through leveraging your personal contacts. Are there people you know who would be thrilled to have a, a volunteer intern or who might even pay a, a, somebody, somebody in high school to be an intern? That's the first thing. Um, other than that, there are you know local nonprofits who always need help. And that can be a great way because you're combining community service with internship in an organization. Very, very uh, helpful. There are also organizations that are, for, for a fee, will match you with a company and will pretty much guarantee an internship. So that's a route that you can take. Okay, and, and those are generally virtual, by the way. Um, what do you recommend for families who would love to work with you but cannot afford the fees? Do you have any more budget-friendly recommendation or advice on how to navigate? Um, we are working on that as we speak. Uh, do connect with us, no matter uh, by email. So uh, it would that would not be a place for us to do a session together. Uh, the strategy session is really if, if you're serious about working with us. But if you see that it's not an app option, uh, send an email. I think that. Um, uh, I think that we have a way of putting the email in the chat, right? And oh, it's here, it's, it's up on the slide, okay? So send us an email, we will send you some free resources, okay? Because basically we want everybody who connects with us to come away with something of value. So um, that's, that's for that. Uh, I'm a junior, I haven't taken any AP classes. Um, okay. Okay, however, a college program to be on track with my associate's degree once I graduate from high school. So I'm not 100% clear on this. Are you planning, if you're planning to apply to a community, if you're just gonna go to a community college and get an associate's degree and then transfer from the community college into a local four-year college, that's fine. You don't have to worry about the rigor. What you want to do in that case is do really well in those community, uh, community college courses because then your transfer application from that community college is going to be all about that. So focus on that. Um, things to avoid in the resume. Huh. Uh, you know, generally speaking, anything that, um, anything that in any way, in an essay, in a resume in an interview in any format where you're denigrating anybody else is not a good plan like you know i am better at my peers than doing x y or z there are other ways to say that you know i have achieved outstanding results in x y or z best not to compare yourself to your peers that's my recommendation um okay and Noah, Noah, 11th grade, right. Um, so there's time, Noah, there's time, okay? You've got next summer, you've got all of this year, you've got all of next year, right? So it's those choices that um, you're gonna make over this time that are gonna be important. Um, okay, is starting a club in high school that is meaningful to your community going to give you a competitive edge? It can. It absolutely can. It depends if it dovetails with your, if it aligns with 
who you are, with your story, with what matters to you, and try to have an impact. Impact is a great word, right? Whatever you do, volunteering, clubs, think about it in terms of impact. What impact can I have in my community? How can I use my talents to benefit the community in a measurable way, right? Impact, measurable. So like, you know, taking, I don't know, X amount of meals to a homeless shelter every month because you raise money through the club to do that. And then it's measurable, measurable impact. That's very helpful. Sometimes it's not measurable. Sometimes it's more qualitative. Things like, you know, um, I got all this feedback from people that, you know, I made a difference or our group made a difference, that kind of thing. Um, very passionate in agriculture, horticulture. Poor test taker, straight A student, uh, child that moves around a lot, don't know where which colleges I'll be near. Right, so I wish that um, if you can post again wh which grade you're in, right? Because if you're, if you're in 11th grade, it's time to start looking. If you're in ninth grade, you've got time. Um, what you want to do eventually is how is is to maximize your uh, involvement in extracurriculars in an impactful way. You want to uh, try to challenge yourself with your classes, to take rigorous classes. But, but again, all of this has to be on a foundation of well-being. You know, students sleeping four hours a night because they're they're taking fourteen APs, um, not recommended under any circumstances. Um, okay, how many volunteer hours would we need? Yeah, there's no there's no such thing as a number. Okay, what you want is don't just check off a box. Think don't think in terms of volunteer hours. Every school has their own thing for that. Think in terms of impact and measurable if possible. If not, you know, uh, impact on your community through your talents, through your activities. Uh, is it possible to start to work with you at the very end of 11th grade or is that too late? It's possible. Um, it's not ideal. I think uh, much better is to start earlier. The earlier the better, but it's perfectly okay. You know, if that's what needs to happen, that's perfectly okay. Uh, scholarship numbers based on four years or per year? Four years. Four years. So um, that's how we've done it. Um, can you put the book name? Uh, I am going to let Brian find the name and put it in the chat. Jeff Selingo, S-E-L-I-N-G-O. -S uh, it's his latest book. Uh, but if you don't get it, you can definitely contact us by email and we will send that to you. Um, I got sick during second semester of 11th grade. Half of my junior year was taken away. So half my junior year, they will only have half to look at. How can I get into a more competitive college? Yeah, I don't want you to worry about that. You, um, you had, um, you know, you, you had an illness. So, you know, that may become part of your story, right? So um, we have to start where we are, you know? We can't, um, for every one of you, there are going to be great colleges that are gonna be a great fit, you know? Uh, research has shown that it is not the rank of the college that predicts future financial success and professional satisfaction, it's what you do when you get to college. It's, ha are you being mentored by professors in college closely? Are you uh, connecting with a college community in a meaningful way? So focus on those things. And then, yeah, maybe, you know, the story of your illness and how you went through it, that's gonna be become part of your story. Okay, um, how do you guys compare stories that are in the same category or very similar to each other? Um, right. So here again, you have to see big picture about the college process. Uh, if you know that each of these selective colleges can admit 10, 15, 20 equally qualified freshman classes, yes, you are being 
uh, and we are being strategic to help you maximize your chances of admission, but you are also recognizing that it's once you get your applications to a certain level, it is a lottery because, you know, that year, do they want a trapeze artist to fill out their aerial silks team? That year, are they looking for an extra, you know, uh, high rated tennis player? And those things are completely out of our control. So what we do is we maximize the quality of what we send them. And then we open our minds to the variety of amazing colleges that are out there rather than fixating on one or two schools. Okay. Um, I was told there are colleges that, is that offer accommodations. There are. This is not my area of expertise. I recommend you look at therapeutic programs. I believe one of the well-known colleges is called Landmark. Look that up, okay? There are um, people who are specialized in helping students find those kinds of colleges. Um, you know, and uh, you, can, you can look uh, for that because there are, there are uh, uh, consultants who are specialized there. Okay, um, best computer science schools in the Midwest, top of the list, Carleton College, yeah, fabulous computer science program. I know this because of the story of my son, and I have no affiliation with Carleton, but I know the quality of their faculty. Uh, it's very tough to get into. It is a reach school, um, but you know, there are others. There's UIUC, there's um, you know, even Michigan State, I mean, there, there are quite a lot of really, really good ones. There's um, University of Michigan. I mean, there, there are a lot in the Midwest that uh, would be worth looking at. Even University of Minnesota Twin Cities would be worth looking at. Um, yeah, and I'm, I, I, you, yeah, we, we can talk about other programs another time. So we, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, let's see. It's the seventh prompt, not the sixth, seven, six, it's not the sixth prompt on the, the common app uh, college, a personal statement. It's the seventh prompt, topic of your choice. You know, I don't see why. Why would an admissions officer look down on that? Um, you know, it's what you do with a prompt. It doesn't matter which prompt you pick. There's not like a hierarchy of better and worse prompts. Um, okay. Let's see. I've been playing the viola for seven years. Is it a good idea to create a music portfolio? Absolutely. What with, you know, video um, and different platforms, either a personal website or YouTube, you know, they, it's, your, it's your chance. Um, you can put it in the additional information section of the Common App, absolutely. Um, yeah. So gap year is, is interesting. Um, gap year, research has shown that students who take a gap year and create a very structured and um, uh, well-designed gap year, so with either internships, jobs, volunteer opportunities, classes, you know, a very well-structured gap year, they arrive in college and they, um, their GPA is 0.5 higher than students who don't take a don't take a gap year. So, college. This was research that was done at Middle Middlebury Colleges. Colleges know this. So, um, when I've had very good uh, results with students who've taken gap years and then written, you want to write a gap year essay, put it in the additional information section of the Common App. And I've had very good success with students who take gap years, but it's got to be well designed. Okay, um, let's see. We don't have we don't have much time. The best thing to look for in a good college. Yes, I see several questions about this. So the most important thing is going to be fit. 
It's how do you fit with a college? How does the college fit with you? What you want to do is have a list of colleges, whether they are likely targets, reaches, far reaches, which are also called lottery schools. Um, you want a list of colleges where you are likely to thrive. So this is, you know, do they have the majors you're interested in? How big the, are those departments and are they going to give you the academic variety and um, quality that you're looking for? Uh, what is the student body like? What are their student run organizations like and what is the campus culture? Where are they located? What is the safety like on campus? Look it up. There are several um, resources. I'm going to give them to you now. There's FISC guide, the FISC guide, F-I-S-K-E, FISC guide, great resource. They have one online. They have one that you can buy as a, a physical book. Um, there is niche.com, which has some great uh, tools. You know, don't take it at face value, but look at those reviews. Look at the ratings. Um, you know, each of the rating systems like niche.com, US News, they all have their pros and cons. So take it with a grain of salt, but combine all this information and then um, go to the college websites, look up their programs, their mission. Do you agree with their school mission? And then um, fourth step, go to, uh, go to Campus Real, R-E-E-L, Campus Real, R-E-E-L, and uh, look at the videos that students have made about their schools. You can also go on YouTube. It's good to see what students are saying about their schools and then see what the fit is. Um, so Sydney, do we have time or should we wrap it up now? I think you I know what her answer is. One last question if you want. Okay. Um, okay. Were you able to find a question? Yeah. So um, how important are awards on my application? If I, What do I do if I have none? So basically, um, you know, if you have awards, that's great. If you have none, you know, don't say I have none. Just leave it blank or, you know, put not available. And, you know, talk about, focus on the positive, focus on what you have done, because, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And that's what I want to leave you with. You know, you, you have a story to tell. And uh, if you focus on that rather than what is missing, you know, I think you'll be in a, in a much better position to uh, share with colleges how you can contribute to their college community, what you have done that has prepared you to be a valuable contributor. It can be sim in simple ways, just like that student who cleaned and cooked for his sister and his mom at home. So don't get too worried about these things. Um, there are enough colleges out there for and good colleges for everybody. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, if you haven't gotten your questions answered, um, you know, you can always reach out by email. Uh, we hope we, those of you who are interested in working with us, we hope we see you at the, at the discovery sessions that you will have booked and uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you, everyone.